have made our membership valuable. And I encourage those of you who uh, are currently uh, not members to uh, look strongly at uh, joining us. Uh, Rogelio did not prompt me for that uh, advertisement. It really does uh, come from the heart. Uh, so today we're going to talk about um, silicon carbide and driving those devices and some of the unique challenges that have emerged that we have um, looked to solve through some of our technologies. So we're all, of course, very familiar with all of the, uh, the benefits of silicon carbide and, uh, and where silicon carbide can help make a difference uh, in your designs. But silicon carbide also creates a series of challenges. As you're operating these devices faster, they tend to create a lot of noise, also uh, have to deal with the noise that gets created, uh, quite susceptible to short circuit. Uh, over voltage, again, another issue that tends to emerge in driving silicon carbide devices fast and hard. Um, and also they tend to get hot and, uh, and hotter uh, than, uh, than IGBTs, for example, certainly given the higher switching frequencies and switching speeds. So uh, while we've got the great benefits of silicon carbide, we need to deal with the, um, the challenges created by uh, implementing silicon carbide in a system. And that's where we developed uh, some digital programmable techniques uh, to try and work with silicon carbide, uh, which needed to uh, take into effect different approaches than you would with standard IGBT devices. And uh, again, this digital approach, perhaps a bit new to some, uh, but we asked the question, why would you try and force fit an analog approach when there's clearly a superior digital solution? Um, analog solutions were fine for silicon switches. They were great for IGBTs. But for silicon carbide, analog is uh, irresponsible and arguably unnecessarily dangerous. So uh, give you a moment here to dwell on this slide. and. Uh, Hoping my uh, screen's refreshing, uh, Rogelio, maybe you can let me know, but uh, this screen should uh, indicate that what we do is we tame the silicon carbide beast and unlock the full capability of SIC. So I just want to confirm if, uh, if your audio is on, if you can tell me if that looks good, or, or Bert, if you can give me a thumbs up. I see your picture. I that, see a uh, racehorse, but he's not moving. It. It's static. He's not moving, that's perfect. <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> Great. So how do we do that? Well, um, we have developed uh, a technique uh, which we've coined as augmented switching. Essentially, we control the turn on and the turn off of the device in steps, very precisely controlled through digital means. And by controlling the turn on and turn off device of the devices precisely, we're able to reduce faults, mitigate ringing, lower EMI, reduce overshoot and undershoot in the system. And we've seen results where, while we're able to do that to improve uh, VDS overshoot by 80%, switching losses by 50%. And we all have also developed uh, detection circuitry for short circuit conditions that are robust, very fast, and also um, allow us to shut down with a profile that is different uh, for short circuit versus um, standard operation. So in a conventional two-level turnoff, you, you tend to have either some fairly fixed values uh, or perhaps a few uh, choices, but overall fairly fixed. With augmented switching, we've introduced additional levels and the ability to control the voltage level and the time at that level quite precisely. And as I noted, we've got a, a, uh, an approach for both um, normal operation where you're typically looking to maximize efficiency and overshoot and versus short circuit operation, where we've introduced an additional step because the goal there is not so much to uh, worry about efficiency, but to safely shut down the device. Of course, today, what you typically see uh, is a very manual approach, changing printed circuit boards, changing gate resistors, perhaps other components, to try and optimize the driving of the silicon carbide device. Uh, what we've brought to the table, we'll talk a little bit further about too, is a programmable approach where we have a programming kit. This is the gate driver and a software application. I'll show you a little bit more about the software application as well, where we're able to control quite a few parameters of the gate drive and the gate drive conditions and situation. So to give you a further sense also, uh, currently uh, the drivers we've developed today fit into the module or um, 
uh, high-end uh, discrete, but primarily servicing silicon carbide modules and their printed circuit board solutions. So we're focused on applications that are over 20 kilo, kilowatts, typically they're under 200 kilohertz, and they fit mostly into the transportation category. And these are some of the early adopter markets for silicon carbide. So traction uh, and other trains, trucks, buses, uh, heavy duty vehicles, uh, EV chargers, EVs of course, the, the big opportunity we're all considering, and this niche market of induction heating. Uh, we also know that, and we'll see emergence of uh, opportunities in the industrial category, uh, but our initial focus today is around the uh, transportation and induction heating segments, which require higher power levels and higher switching frequencies um, that, uh, than certainly the, uh, the IGBTs that, you, that you're used to. Um, so why customers have, have chosen uh, these, these drivers, and what were some of the challenges that they've run into that caused them to say, let's uh, take a look at augmented switching? Um, so a couple of customer design challenges, one being false alarms, uh, where uh, they were seeing short circuits uh, under voltage conditions, often caused by noise, uh, and drivers that weren't optimized for SIC. And what we see a lot of is customers um, who were first trying to do their designs, the initial approach is to say, well, let's just take what we did for a standard IGBT and uh, drop in the silicon carbide uh, MOSFET and, you know, keep the bus bars, keep everything the same, keep the drivers the same or as close as possible. Usually they, they found uh, a lot of issues with that and have been moving more and more to uh, gate drivers that are optimized specifically for silicon carbide. Uh, so we helped with our robust uh, short circuit detection and protection circuitry in that case. Uh, a short circuit response, which was too low, uh, based on more of an analog approach, we'll say, to short circuit detection, and our fast, accurate digital solution helped solve that. Uh, voltage overshoot, again, another major issue in driving silicon carbide devices. Often that's due to an inefficient internal connection system, and precise software control allows for tuning, where through changing values on, a, on, our, on the screen, you're able to find that trade-off between voltage overshoot and, uh, and efficiency. And overall, uh, insufficient uh, data about the module itself and how it's performing. Uh, most drivers have very limited uh, fault feedback. We provide up to seven specific fault codes, including real-time temperature and voltage monitoring. Um, our products today are primarily plug-and-play drivers. We also offer gate driver cores, which serve as a building block, and we have uh, our first generation of gate driver IC currently in our products, but we'll be releasing those towards the end of the year, or early next year. And we're working mostly with modules in the 650 volt and above range, rated at uh, 1200 volt and 1700 volt. Uh, we have 3.3 kV for IGBTs. We still have some of those, but are doing some development work for 3.3 kV silicon carbide. And we, and we address 1200 volt and 1700 volt modules for, with our core offerings. So for our plug and play drivers, we work with a variety of manufacturers uh, that we support. Uh, the Econodual type package from Rome, the 62 millimeter package, we offer uh, versions at Microchip. Uh, these are also offered by Wolfspeed, Infineon, Semicron, and a number of others. And we're looking very closely uh, for uh, future development for 3.3 kV in the XHP package and are uh, looking to uh, do some work with uh, early adopter or, uh, or uh, test customers in that realm. So if uh, that's an area of interest here, uh, we would certainly be interested in talking to you and perhaps working together on some uh, development efforts for 3.3 kV drivers for the XHP style modules. Our cores um, are uh, small uh, uh, printed circuit board assemblies that are designed for either 1200 volt or, or 1700 volt modules. We also have different uh, power levels and uh, peak currents. Uh, one of the unique features of these cores are that the uh, gate voltages are programmable. So rather than you know, going out, trying to get another core. Again, we've also implemented uh, gate voltage uh, values that are programmable for, through the uh, software application. And with that, we're able to uh, put together an approach which involves taking a core and an adapter board with a gate driver, uh, with a, uh, an SIC MOSFET module to create more of a full solution. 
So this approach is one that we've been doing now for a number of years. It's actually very common in the industry. Uh, you'll see approaches like this from Semicron, Power Integrations, and others uh, with this core and adapter board approach. This is an example of the microchip SP6LI, a low inductance module. And in this case, we're able to mount the uh, driver board on top of the module, so you get a very compact solution as well. And uh, our plans are to continue to release uh, the adapter boards across a variety of uh, module types. Uh, here again, uh, if you have a module type that you don't see here, that either you're developing internally, maybe it's a custom module, or if it's a module type that uh, you feel is, uh, is emerging, if you're a, another uh, module supplier, uh, we look forward to working with you to uh, develop the adapter boards. So by the, uh, certainly by the end of this upcoming quarter, we'll be able to support uh, some of the four most popular module types, uh, but we're continuing to develop these adapter boards. One of the other uh, key elements that we found to help customers really understand these new techniques are uh, through our application development kits, where we provide a core, an adapter board, a controller, and the software. And in a moment, I'll show you a little bit about how the, uh, how the software operates. So where we tend to uh, support applications today, where we found augmented switching, showing really a high degree of value, 20 kilowatts and higher, uh, where someone is using uh, SIC MOSFET modules or considering it, uh, switch voltage ranges from 600 volts to 1700 volts with 3.3 kV in the future. Uh, the applications that we discussed earlier for EVs, chargers, energy storage to a degree, I didn't mention that earlier, trains, trams, trolleys, buses, heavy duty vehicles, microgrid is another emerging application, solid state transformers. Uh, induction heating currently under 200 kilohertz switching frequency, we are looking at higher switching frequency applications as well, and some of the higher uh, power and voltage level wind, solar, and uh, motor drive applications. But for us initially, uh, not uh, as much the focus, and I think we've all seen that to be the case with uh, silicon carbide adoption today. With modules uh, representing the uh, SP6LI, D3, SP6, 62 millimeter, Akana dual package, and uh, Wolfspeed XM3, also the Wolfspeed black and gold, we support that as well. Uh, you can reach us uh, through a couple of means, of course. Uh, while we are part of Microchip, uh, we were acquired by Microchip uh, in the fall of 2019. Uh, we still do have the AgileSwitch.com website, so that's sort of a quick path to get some information. Uh, joining me on the call also is Nitesh Satish. Uh, he is in uh, APAC and handles, we'll call it, rest of the world. Cliff Robbins, based in the UK, handles EMEA and the Americas. And of course, uh, you can reach out to, to me as well at, at any time. Um, just to give you a, a little bit of some of the test data that we've covered, and, um, and uh, Rohelio, I'm gonna ask you if you would please, if you can uh, unmute uh, Nitesh, or maybe Nitesh can unmute himself, or Cliff Robbins, or both, because they may uh, join in with me on some of these co comments. Um, this is an example sure. of a case, case study of uh, conventional versus augmented switching. And what we did in these studies is we looked at uh, working with different gate resistor values as you would in, a, I'll say, a more traditional approach. Uh, one ohm, uh, 5.6 ohm, and 10 ohm uh, for uh, turn off gate resistor values. And we measured the energy and the overshoot at each case, uh, as you'd expect. Uh, you know, putting in higher gate resistors, you're going to lower your overshoot. So going down from 450 volt to 200 volt, but you're also going to increase your energy burn. Uh, so you can see that uh, going from 3.9 to 12.5 millijoule. Uh, what we did in uh, the augmented switching example is it started with a much lower gate resistor value, uh, so half an ohm gate resistor. And there we were able to modify the turnoff levels and turnoff times. And for you know an example, to achieve, let's say, a similar voltage overshoot level that you would have to use a 10 ohm gate resistor for, so 220, let's say, versus 200, um, we've got an energy uh, burn uh, more than half of the level of the energy burn. So you can see where you know over a 50% reduction would would occur. So an example again of you know doing some work here, let's say to mod to modify uh, either overshoot or or efficiency or work through those trade-offs. 
uh, by just changing a few values on a screen. Um, we also uh, took a look at, um, uh, you know, overshoot very specifically. Uh, this was an example looking at a, a wolf speed 1700 volt 300 amp module. Uh, in this instance, we were able through uh, modifying the augmented switching uh, to reduce the overshoot from 500 volts down to 200 volts. Uh, this is also an approach that you could use to perhaps uh, feel more comfortable using a lower voltage rated module uh, depending on your application as well, which can be another cost savings in your application. Um, we've got a series of part numbers. I won't, won't jump into those. Uh, but what I did want to show you next is what the software looks like. Um, Rogelio, um, I just wanted to make sure that uh, you can see the screen now, which says core settings, where I'm pointing my cursor. Yes, I see it. Perfect. Thank you so much. So what you see here with this screen is the screen that comes up uh, if you're looking to work with uh, our augmented switching technology. And we have it in both a um, uh, values-based and a graphical-based uh, approach. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, so what we do at Microchip is we bring in modules, our own modules from other companies, and we characterize those with the augmented switching uh, uh, turnoff techniques. What we then do is we develop some predefined settings. So if you're working with any of the modules that we've, um, we've uh, characterized, you're able to load those values in that we've determined uh, to be sort of an optimal starting point. So what you can see here is a micro semi, now micro switch part. And uh, we've um, loaded in or, and have developed some of the key settings to optimize performance. So I apply those settings. And what you'll see is uh, those values automatically populate. Uh, we've got the uh, gate voltage levels. We've got turn on operation, normal operation, uh, two level turn off uh, voltage levels and timing, as well as DSAT operation voltage levels and timing, you can see the multiple steps, will uh, enable um, under voltage and over voltage fault detection. We'll choose the 1200 volt core product, setting the fault output uh, active level to high, and we'll pick a dead time of, let's say, 430 nanoseconds. Uh, we'll allow, uh, let's, let's make it actually automatic reset, uh, but we'll put in a four millisecond uh, delay. Uh, we will enable DC link monitoring. Since this is a 1200 volt device, let's put in a 1000 volt, maybe that's a little too high, but we'll put in a 1000 volt uh, shutdown level. And we'll turn on uh, temperature monitoring as well. This is non-isolated. We can also work with isolated thermistors. And we'll put in a uh, temperature fault letter level at, oh, let's make it a little higher, 90 degrees C. Uh, what we've done at this point is configured the gate driver, and we're able to then compile those results, save it to the driver, and run our short, our um, uh, double pulse or other testing. Uh, let's say we've done that, and let's say we've determined that, uh, you know, overall looks pretty good, um, but we want to adjust perhaps for, let's say, uh, higher efficiency or um, voltage uh, or, uh, or uh, uh, voltage overshoot. We then have the ability to graphically come in and modify the two level turn off settings. So as you can see here, I uh, shortened uh, the, the time to get to that uh, first level. I raised the voltage level and I shortened the time. I did both. That then auto populates into the GUI. We're able to do that as well with short circuit detection. So let's say we want to change these values. And again, it gives us a good visualization of what's happening in the turnoff that enables us to then go back, have those values populated, save another setting. And we've had customers who have basically saved dozens of settings to really tweak and fine tune that trade off between overshoot ringing efficiency that they're looking to achieve in their, in their uh, device, as well as uh, continuing to uh, effectively protect against short circuit conditions. So um, with that, uh, I know uh, Rogelio mentioned uh, 40, but I kept up to about 20, uh, just so that we'd also have uh, some additional time uh, for some of the questions that you may have. 
and uh, I'll bounce back a little bit. I just want to do a quick sound check and an introduction of uh, Nitesh Satish. Uh, Nitesh, are you, uh, are you there? Hey, Rob and the rest of the team. Yes, this is Nitesh. Okay, and Cliff Robbins. Cliff, I saw you there a moment ago. You still might be on mute, but um, uh, Cliff Robbins has joined us as well. So uh, again, we're able to uh, talk to you from uh, Nitesh in Bangalore, me in Philly, and uh, Cliff in London. So uh, Rogelio, I think at this point, um, I know you've uh, had some questions uh, streaming in. And uh, perhaps we could uh, jump into some of those questions and, and move into the Q&A section. Yeah, thank you very much, Rob. That was a very good presentation. Enjoyed learning about the uh, augmenting sw augmented switching technique and uh, visualization of the uh, GUI. Again, I want to ask all the participants, if you uh, <clears throat> move your cursor down to the bottom of your screen, select the uh, chat. Uh, uh, option and type your question into the chat window that will pop up and I'll read the questions out and then uh, Rob will answer them. So I'll begin with the first one that I received so far. How is a short circuit identified using this augmented method? Is it conventional DSAT protection? I, I'm going to turn some of those hands over to Natash. Yes, thank you. Okay, yes, so uh, the detection is a DSAT method similar to what we would use in an IGBT or another uh, circuit. But the response is different because we have a multi-level turnoff, uh, a soft turnoff, if you will. Thank you. Next question is, what is the, ma what is the maximum frequency uh, this family of gate drivers switch? Can this family of gate drivers switch? So that's uh, going to be dependent on the product family. Uh, the uh, flagship for us is the 62 millimeter, which drives, let's say, the CAS 300 or the D3 pack or the 62 millimeter. Now, for this particular type, we have a 10 watt per channel. Uh, and depending on the gate charge of the module, you know, it can go up to 200 kilohertz, 250 kilohertz. Uh, so I'd say, you know, we could call it uh, 200 kilohertz uh, given our. Losing you, Nitesh. Can you speak a little louder, please? Sorry. Yes. So uh, I was saying that the uh, you know it depends on the family of product. Uh, if you take our flagship, which is the 62 EM series, uh, it has a 10 watt per channel. And uh, given the condition, such as you know gate charge and the modules available in the market today, uh, I'd say 200 to 250 kilohertz. Okay. Thanks. Next question. Is this a closed loop design? Do you need current sensing or voltage sensing? So the current implementation on the gate drivers shown are not closed loop, they're open loop. Uh, but you know, uh, we, we do have investigations into closed loop designs. Okay, what is the lowest short, uh, what is the lowest setting for short circuit? Okay, so uh, I'm assuming they're talking about the blanking time or the reference voltage. Reference voltage obviously is dependent on the device, uh, but for blanking time, you know, we can go as low as uh, 500 nanoseconds. Uh, so in experimentation, of course, in a lab setting, we've been able to detect short circuit at 500 or 600 nanoseconds, uh, with the total turnoff time being less than one microsecond. But typically, going into production, uh, most customers choose an 800 to 900 nanosecond window for detection with the total turnoff time being less than 1.5 microseconds. Okay, why stop at two or three voltage levels? Why not an RF DAC that could tailor the entire gate voltage waveform? Uh, the sky is the limit, really. I mean, we could do that, uh, but you know, we also have to look at uh, the benefit uh, versus you know what we're putting into the drive. Uh, there, there's obviously uh, you know uh, challenges associated with doing you know. Uh, 15 levels, let's say, uh, and what the benefit that we get versus uh, uh, one level or two levels or 15 levels is uh, probably minimal. So from our experience, uh, we've seen that normal operation. Um, uh, okay, sorry, can you can you hear me better now? Hopefully, yes. Yes. Okay. Whatever, wh whatever you do next, whatever you do, tends to work really well. So if you, if you could keep that. 
Okay. Uh, so so uh, what I was saying was it, it's really uh, an analysis of, you know, uh, what's beneficial. We could go up to 15, 20, 30, or, uh, you know, in infinite number of levels. Uh, but we found that uh, this is most beneficial uh, economically and uh, not just economically, in, in just terms of the benefit that we get with the one level uh, versus, you know, infinite levels. Okay. Are all of these products shared today autom automotive qualified to uh, AEC Q100? Uh, so today they have uh, not gone through AEC Q100 qualification. Uh, however, the uh, gate driver ICs that we have and have in development uh, will be. Okay. What is the resolution and jitter of the timing? Okay. So the resolution on the settings, for example, for the augmented switching is uh, 32 nanoseconds. Uh, with our next generation of drivers, it's going to be less than that. It's about 20 nanoseconds. And uh, jitter, uh, if you mean on uh, the output, um, I think it's less than 20 nanoseconds as well. Okay. What is the minimum turnoff time for detected overcurrent slash desaturation? So I went into this, uh, you know, in one of my previous comments, but we've, we've uh, demonstrated less than a microsecond, uh, 800, 900 nanoseconds. Uh, but typically, it's around 1.2 to 1.5 microseconds. Okay. Does the software take in C ISS, C sub OSS, and C dash RSS of the MOSFET being driven so that the software automatically can make a first guess of the optimized parameters? <laughs> so today, uh, it's not the software that does it. It's the engineers behind uh, the screen. Uh, <laughs> But, I love but, I love the idea. <laughs> it's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if DSAT protection is used, what is the reference voltage? Is it fixed or can the user vary it? Uh, it it's variable. So uh, one of the settings in the DSAT box that you know, Rob has brought up, it's the second parameter uh, after multi-level turnoff. It's the voltage level slash blanking time. So right now on the screen you see 4.5 volts, uh, but it can go down to uh, one volt, two volt, or you know uh, whatever really. On this okay. particular, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, continue. I was going to say on this screen you see uh, the minimum is three volts, but you know we we can go lower than that. Okay, thank you. If the MOSFET has a current sense pin on the source. Can your driver make use of that for overcurrent or over temperature shutoff? Uh, yes, that's certainly possible and uh, probably better too. Uh, but it would depend on which driver we would be using because our current plug and play drivers probably cannot accommodate that. But with the core, uh, we have the flexibility of redesigning an adapter board to make use of the Kelvin source connection. Okay. Uh, All right. Once a set of. Sorry, uh, I'd like ahead. to ask the uh, yeah I'd like to ask the questioner if um, if there's a module like that on the market we'd like to know about it. All right, we'll give them a minute to reply, but in the meantime, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, once a set of optimum parameters are determined, is it feasible to implement or approximate the gate driver characteristics? using analog circuitry to save on cost, complexity, bulk, et cetera? So, uh, Rob, uh, I mean, I, th I think we should talk about the ASD2, and uh, it's probably better that you do it. So we, uh, we currently are um, using our uh, gate driver IC that implements these techniques uh, internally on our uh, cores and our plug-and-play driver boards. Uh, however, now that we are a part of Microchip, we are working uh, to release that as a standalone gate driver IC. Uh, so once we do that, you'll be able to get all the benefits that you see here, um, but also design your gate driver board or core uh, from the ground up yourself with our gate driver IC. Um, so the short answer, or maybe it's the long answer to the question is, um, to try and replicate this through analog means is it, it actually much more expensive, which is why we, we developed our own gate driver IC to incorporate that in. Uh, so the next thing we're going to uh, need to do, as we've mentioned, is to release that as a 
fully qualified uh, gate driver through the uh, through the microchip channel. Okay, can this safely turn off GAN devices and short circuit? So, uh, uh, Rob, do you want to take that as well? I mean, we haven't done any characterization with uh, GAN, but you know, that may be something. Yeah, just a reinforce what the test just said. We we actually have not yet done any work uh, experimenting with uh, with GAN devices. Um, again, there again, we certainly would be uh, interested in talking some to some Power America members about that. Uh, but we've just been so uh, consumed uh, with uh, building out the line for uh, silicon carbide uh, that we haven't really addressed uh, addressed GAN the way we would we would and we would like to in in investigation. Okay, here's a response to the previous questioner regarding the current sense pin, although it's from a different uh, participant. He says, Mitsubishi has a module with current sense on the MOSFET source. Okay, okay. yeah, so if they could send us, uh, really would love to take a look at it. Um, one of the things that we do, and uh, Nitesh uh, has uh, actually set up a full capability in, in India, we, we call it our uh, module adapter board factory for our internal shorthand, is to constantly look at new devices and the device requirements. And with our core driver and, and with the uh, upcoming qualified ASD2 chip, we're then going to look at every module as it comes out and, and do an evaluation as to whether uh, it makes sense for us to, um, to release an adapter board. Um, and I think we would probably solve that question at the adapter board level tied in with our core driver. So. Uh, if they would be kind enough to uh, to send us that that uh, part number, we'd love to take a look at it. Okay, when we're done with the questions, you may want to put up the slide again that has all of your contact information on it so people can get in touch with you easily. Okay, the next question, is there any effect on the efficiency and thermal? Are there any measurements, were there any measurements done to show the effect? Okay, so uh, one of the slides that Rob showed uh, did show the improvement in efficiency. Uh, Rob, if you want to go to slide 20. Yep, so this is the slide that shows the efficiency improvement. Uh, but if the question is, uh, does it vary over temperature? Uh, yes, I mean, if the device characteristics vary over temperature, then this number will also vary. Uh, we haven't performed a study yet to show what that variation is, but it's on our list to do it. Okay, thank you. The next question is, with proper gate drive, GAN does have short circuit capability. We have an ARPA-E project to study the long-term reliability when used this way. I guess just a statement, not a question. Yeah, I think he's responding to one of the previous questions. Okay. Next uh, question, on the plug and play drivers, is there galvanic isolation? If so, where is this implemented? Gate driver, core, discrete isolators, et cetera. Yes, so the gate driver cores and the plug and play boards both have galvanic isolation. Uh, they are implemented discreetly. Uh, so. so on the core here, you can't see the, the you can't see the devices, but they're on the bottom side of the board. And on the plug and play driver, I believe the same, but they are discrete devices as uh, isolators as test mission. Thanks. What is the DVDT noise immunity with the galvanic plug and plug and play driver? Uh, it's a minimum of 100 kV per microsecond. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any more questions from anyone on the webinar? It's always a good thing when the uh, Q&A session all, lasts almost as long as the actual presentation. So obviously a lot of interest uh, in this topic. And much, much appreciated. Yeah, so I've posted uh, here on the screen uh, how to contact us, uh, Nitesh, Cliff, myself. Uh, so our email address is first, initial, first name dot last name at microchip dot com, uh, as well as our uh, our phone numbers in the U.S. 
uh, Europe and uh, and India. So happy to help you anywhere in the world. And um, again, uh, looking forward to uh, to working with Power America. As we've said, we've uh, we've done projects with Power America and Power America members, and um, it's really been an incredibly valuable organization, as events like today prove. Well, thanks, Rob, and thanks to the entire uh, Agile Switch slash microchip team for this excellent presentation. And thank you all who participated today for joining us. Uh, and we hope to do another webinar uh, approximately Wednesday, May 6th. Uh, that speaker I haven't been able to get in touch with, but uh, we'll continue to try to lock that down and we'll send you the WebEx information uh, a week in advance as always when we do that. So thanks again to everyone for joining us. Thanks again to Rob and uh, Agile Switch and Nitesh and the rest of the team. And have a wonderful afternoon. Rob, are you still there?